Good morning. My name is Tim Jones and I'm one of the planning barristers at Number 5 Chambers. Uh, welcome to our seminar on Without Notice Injunctions. There's a question and answer function that you should have on your screen. Please use that to ask any questions you have. Uh, we can't guarantee to ask, answer all the questions if there are a lot of them, uh, but we will do our best. Also, there is a feedback form that will be circulated and we'd be very grateful if you would complete that. Uh, it does help us to improve our webinars and our seminars uh, if we know what we get wrong, or for that matter, if we know what we get right. Uh, the, sli <coughs> the slides that uh, you'll see on your screen are available as a PowerPoint uh, on request. So please email marketing at number5.com if you'd like some of those slides. Now, I'm going to be talking about without notice injunctions. Now, the older ones among us will remember them as ex parte injunctions. And the principles that apply to without notice injunctions apply to all such injunctions, whether it's an oil company cartel or Tommy and Rose Smith on a half acre field. Uh, they apply to all things that local authorities seek without notice injunctions for whether it's a public health injunction, a planning injunction, or someone gluing themselves to your chief executive's parking space. The principles are well established, and a court is not likely to show sympathy to barristers or solicitors who say that they didn't know them. And underlying those principles is the principle of fairness, a principle that underlies the law of England and Wales. So why is this general matter being included in a webinar about gypsies and travellers? Uh, and the answer is straightforward. The principles are not always complied with in, by those seeking such injunctions. They have consequences, and sooner or later, they will have very severe consequences. Dealing then with without notice injunctions. A without notice injunction is sought and granted with only one side being heard. And this, of course, is an exception to the normal rule that applies uh, throughout almost all of the law of England and Wales, that both sides to a dispute should have an opportunity to be heard before a decision is made. And the two points that follow from that, it must be justified by a very good reason, and it places demanding obligations on a party seeking to be heard without notice. A failure to justify the granting of an exceptional remedy means, quite simply, it won't be granted, and breach of the obligations may have severe consequences. It is, as I've said, an exceptional remedy, a comment that's been many, many times by judges, including in the Moat housing, housing Group South case. As a matter of principle, no order should be made without notice to the other side, unless there is a very good reason that notice must be given. For example, where giving notice might itself defeat the ends of justice. To grant, to grant an interim remedy is a form of injunction, in the form of an injunction without notice, is to grant an exceptional remedy. So when may an application for without notice injunction be made? The court should not entertain a without notice application unless either giving notice would enable a defendant to take steps to defeat the injunction's purpose, or there has been literally no time to give notice before the injunction is required to protect the threatened wrongful act. Uh, and can I just pause there and add to that? No time doesn't mean someone has sat on a matter for months and it's got to the last day. It means that there's reasonably no time uh, for what has happened. And a court won't look with sympathy for someone who say they've got no time because they haven't acted when they could have acted. Now, in addition to showing uh, the facts to justify an exceptional remedy, there is also the duty of disclosure. 
Of course, in a typical case, while advocates have a duty to inform courts of relevant facts and authorities, uh, to some extent, at least, the court can rely on each party to put its case, uh, particularly where they're represented. That, of course, isn't in any way the case when you're seeking a without notice injunction. Uh, and it's well established that it's the duty of both an applicant and of those representing an applicant to make full and frank disclosure of all material facts of which the court should be made aware. So can I just emphasize the points in that indent? First, it's both the duty of the applicant, typically in a gypsy injunction, the counsel, and of those representing the applicant to make full and frank disclosure. The disclosure must be full and frank, and it is all material facts. And I've given the practice direction uh, reference there. Uh, and this includes all matters of fact and law which are or may be adverse to the applicant. Applicants must disclose any fact known to him which might affect the judge's decision whether to grant relief or what relief to grant. Uh, so typically uh, in a gypsy injunction, uh, the form of order may be exceptionally mandatory, uh, which requires someone to leave land, uh, let us say a species, protected species was at risk, or it may far more common, commonly be a status quo injunction. Uh, and so uh, knowledge that someone is living on the land or claiming to live on the land is clearly a material fact. And the applicants must protect, present the facts fairly. The applicant is in the duty to investigate the facts and to present the evidence on which they fairly rely. And again, in a leading authority on this matter, the situ number one case, uh, we, we see uh, it cannot be emphasized too strongly that an urgent without notice hearing for any form of interim injunction, there's a high duty to make full, fair and accurate disclosure of material information to the court and to draw the court's attention to significant factual, legal and procedural aspects. Moving on now to a case which conveniently summarizes key points uh, on a without notice injunction, Ciparex Trade and Comdel Commodities. Applicants must show the utmost good faith and disclose their case fully and fairly. They must, for the defendant's protection and information, summarize their case and the evidence. And can I draw your attention, it's not just the defendant's protection that they should be in a position that they would be in a contested matter, it's also for their information. A party, however much at fault, is entitled to know what's being said against them. They must clearly identify the crucial points for and against the application and not rely on general statement and the mere exhibiting of numerous documents. I'm going to come back to point three in a little while. They must investigate the nature of the claim and the facts before applying and must identify likely defenses. Note the word investigate. If you don't investigate matters, you may well be subject to uh, substantial criticism. They must disclose all facts which reasonably could be taken into account by the judge in deciding whether to grant the application. That's again, it could be taken into account. The applicant is not the judge. They can't discount things merely because they think a judge might not bear those in mind. So what's that mean in practice in gypsy and traveler cases? Well, one thing it definitely means, uh, the duty to disclose the law includes the duty to inform the court of South Buckinghamshire and Porter number one, and to explain it fairly without inappropriate selectivity. Now, it may well be the case that in contested matters where the other side is present, uh, the council picks the bits of South Bucks and Porter that most favour the council, uh, the defendant picks the bits that most favour the defendant. In a without notice application, that is wholly unacceptable. 
You've got to draw intention, the comments uh, related to, for example, hardship um, within South Park and Porter, uh, and you've got to do so uh, fairly when you, when you, if you're applying for the injunction, when you do that. A council's duty to inform the court of the facts includes all the facts known to the council. So it's not, as I've seen in some cases, just those facts known to an enforcement officer. Uh, it's not acceptable. Um, uh, it's not acceptable to say, well, we didn't know. The enforcement officer didn't know of an application for planning permission, which disclosed that there were three children living on the land. Uh, one must, uh, uh, and it's also, uh, as uh, Cyprex's third point makes plain, not acceptable when you're referring to Porter or a planning application or anything else that's relevant to say, well, of course we told the court about it. Um, it's on in exhibit 17 at page 357 of the bundle. Uh, it has to be properly drawn attention to the court uh, and to stand up and say, well, of course the judge will have read every page of the exhibits and would absorb, have absorbed, understood their relevance. What may be a brief application uh, is not something which is allowed. Uh, facts known to the council or it should reasonably be accepted to ascertain in relation to relevant considerations may include hardship. Whether, and that of course is particularly the Porter case, or whether suitable accommodation is available, and that particularly is the Buckley and United Kingdom and Chapman in United Kingdom cases, gypsy and traveler accommodation assessments, which go to uh, alternative sites, uh, and inspectors appeal decisions which have considered uh, the level of need. Uh, what, for example, would be totally unacceptable would be if a local planning authority say, um, we are satisfied uh, that we have sufficient pitches uh, when there have been inspectors appeal decisions which have taken a contrary view. Uh, the court has a right to know those facts and in fairness, uh, they should be disclosed. The disclosure duty is, uh, has a continuing no nature. So if you discover facts, uh, for example, it, if between obtaining the order and it being served, you, one has to go back to the judge, um, facts that might occur, make the judge alter his decision and inform them of it. So for example, if an application for planning permission were lodged uh, between the making of the order and its service, um, then the judge should be informed of that fact. It's a continuing duty. It doesn't end uh, when the without notice hearing uh, has been completed. So what are the consequences if there is a breach of the disclosure, disclosure duty? Uh, the, the shortest answer would be to say the court has a discretion what to do. Discharge of the order is not automatic. And when you look at the authorities, you can see the direction in which they lean. If the duty is not observed, the court may discharge the injunction, and it is no excuse for an applicant to say that they were not aware of the importance of the matters that they omitted to state. And this is so even if, after inquiry, the view is taken that the order would probably, uh, would probably be made anyway. Uh, the court's strongly inclined towards setting aside. Uh, basically, judges are, are very concerned that they are told the whole truth, and they're particularly concerned they're hold the, told the whole truth uh, when only one side is heard. Uh, and in addition to the risk that the order may be set aside, and of course they're intermediate positions, the order may be reduced uh, in its extent as well as set aside, indemnity costs may be ordered. Uh, and that's perhaps particularly likely if it's felt there's a great fault on the part of an applicant. Now, another matter which those applying uh, for injunctions have to bear in mind, and those who have them made against will no doubt um, also bear in mind, is there's a duty to provide notes of the without notice hearing. Applicants are under duty to provide full notes of the hearing with all expedition to any party that would be affected. 
And both counsel and solicitor should take full notes of what was said. It's no good thinking it's okay, my counsel, or it's okay, my instructing solicitor will take the notes. Both are under duty to take full notes of what was said at the hearing. And they cannot expect that a transcript of the hearing would be available or would suffice. And the notes are important, not only to inform anyone notified of the order what evidence was put before the court, but also to inform them of any points that may have been raised by the judge. So it's not enough just to say, well, what we argued was in the skeleton arguments. The judge may have queried something and the defendants or defendant are entitled to know what the judge says, as well as anything that was said to the judge. So the consequence of the consequence of uh, failure, the slide should say, of the duty to take full notes. Uh, the first thing is uh, a well-advised defendant, sir, with the right without notice injunction, will promptly ask for the notes, see what was said to the judge. Was Porter fairly mentioned? Uh, where um, children whose existence were known drawn to the attention of the court, and so on, uh, and a failure to take full notes may result uh, in an indemnity costs order. Um, all authorities, by the way, will be on the slides uh, and the references can be provided. So to move to my conclusions, uh, underlying the rules that apply to seeking without notice injunction is the principle of fairness to someone who has no opportunity to be present. And if you think about it, <coughs> Has the judge been told about South Bucks and Porter? Remember, these are not a specialist planning court. It will be the Queen's Bench Division or a county court. And I've certainly had cases where the first thing a judge has said to me is, uh, I did never dealt with a planning case before. Um, they should all know about general principles about notice injunctions. They should be told about cases like Porter. They should be told about how, uh, where their children are involved, um, they are a primary consideration. Uh, and the second thing to bear in mind is the courts take these principles very seriously and they have strong powers if unfairness occurs. So thank you for listening. Uh, I see I've no um, outstanding questions for me at this stage, so please feel free to put them in. So thank you again uh, and over to Hugh. Good. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm going to cover two topics. Uh, firstly, um, the uh, recent case law around getting injunctions against persons unknown. And that was one of the questions in the Q&A box um, earlier on this morning. And then secondly, to say something about borough-wide injunctions um, uh, following a, a recent case on precisely that topic. So those are the two matters I'm going to deal with. Um, and uh, as before, continue to post your questions in the Q&A boxes. If Tim knows the answers, um, he might kindly um, uh, 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 type an answer. If not, we'll come back to it at the end of the talk. So here we go. Let's uh, first of all talk about persons unknown. And the, the case here is um, uh, Bromley and persons unknown from 2020. Now, I know that there are um, a mixture of uh, attendees. Some of you are lawyers, some of you are planners, some of you um, are local authorities from local authorities, and some are for the, from the private sector. Um, so we've got uh, uh, all skills and all sides of the fence, as it were, re represented today. So the lawyers need to take a, um, a note, perhaps, of the case citation. But you go against persons unknown, you bring a, a claim against persons unknown when you when it's impossible to name the defendants. And um, the persons unknown route is another example of an exception to the general rule uh, and an ex exception because uh, normally a um, uh, uh, legal proceedings in this country which are adversarial, uh, have to be fair, um, and both uh, under um, the common law and also uh, Article 6 of the European Convention. 
Um, and the court is being asked to grant an injunction against somebody who is not there to put their side of the case. Um, in the Barking and Dagenham case um, this year, there was a very detailed examination of the person's unknown process by uh, Mr Justice Nicklin, who's taking a keen interest in these sorts of injunctions. So, um, uh, Mr Justice Nicklin um, uh, explained uh, why it was important for people generally to have notice of proceedings so that they could be heard. Um, and uh, he discussed uh, the issue of persons unknown by analysing um, the issue uh, in terms of, well, how are we going to bring these proceedings to the notice of the person whose name is unknown um, through um, an examination of the service process? And he said that uh, any alternative means of service, that's alternative to the usual rules by uh, handing um, uh, court papers to the individual defendant or by um, delivering it to their home address or place of business, um, these alternative means of service uh, must be such as to uh, uh, enable the court to assume that it would be reasonably expected uh, that the proceedings would be brought to their attention. And Mr Justice Nicklin said, well, when it's possible to um, locate or communicate with uh, this anonymous def defendant and to identify him or her as the person described in the claim form, then it's possible to serve it. And he accepted that injunctions, planning injunctions, are exceptions to the general rule uh, against claims against unnamed parties. But, he said, the persons unknown must be described in such a way so that you could both be certain uh, as to who was included in the injunction, but also who were not. And he identified two categories of persons unknown. Um, firstly, anonymous defendants. You don't know their name, but you can identify them. For example, uh, squatters, because you'd be able to identify them as persons unknown uh, living in a particular building. But he said there are a second category of persons unknown who are not only uh, anonymous, you don't know their names, but they can't be identified. So, for example, a hit and run driver. And if you can't identify them in some way, uh, then they can't be um, parties to the litigation. Uh, he also said this. Defining an unknown person by reference to something that he has done in the past does not identify anyone. And uh, at the end of that quote, he said, it's not enough that the wrongdoer, him or herself, knows who she or he is. So you can't describe persons unknown by reference to something they've done in the past. So, for example, persons unknown who have deposited um, hardcore on a site. Uh, you can identify persons who are living on a site or who are depositing on the site. And then um, he also said, he said that in principle, an interim injunction could be granted against newcomers, i.e. persons who had not committed any of the prohibited acts at the time when the injunction was granted. So you could give, you could uh, um, describe persons unknown as being persons unknown living or intending to live on a site, or persons unknown depositing or intending to deposit hardcore. 
But as we'll see in a moment, that's for an interim injunction. For a final injunction, uh, after the trial has been completed, um, you can't have uh, those injunctions granted against newcomers. So how then do we describe persons unknown? Well, obviously, first of all, we haven't yet identified them. If you can identify them, then they should be named as defendants. As we've just discussed, they can be people who will in the future fall within the class of persons unknown. You must describe them by reference to their conduct, which is alleged to be unlawful. And we've discussed that. They must be capable of, bringing, of being identified and being served. And this is important. It must be done in non-technical non language. So you can't serve, uh, you can't describe persons unknown as being persons intending to breach planning control. Because um, if I read a, uh, a, a an injunction order that, that's addressed to persons unknown intending to breach planning control, that assumes uh, that I understand what um, being in breach of planning control means. And then, as we said, uh, if it's an interim injunction you're after, that can be granted against uh, a future persons unknown, but final injunctions can't be. Now, there are rules of court as well that uh, cover um, how you describe defendants. Uh, and the, the rules say that they, the, um, uh, if, if you don't know their name, then you must describe the defendant by reference to a photograph. So um, persons unknown, um, identified in the photograph attached at Annex A, um, or a thing belonging to or in the possession of the defendant. So persons unknown being the owner of the motor vehicle registration number X shown in the photograph attached, or any other evidence. And it, what's required is a description that's sufficiently clear to enable both the, def the defendant to be served with the proceedings. And the rules of court say that the application must be accompanied by a witness statement, and that witness statement must state that the applicant, in this case the counsel, was unable to uh, ascertain the defendant's identity within the time reasonably available, and must set out the steps taken to ascertain the defendant's identity, and the means by which the defendant has been described in the claim form, and that that description is the best the applicant is able to provide. So that, for example, on a site that's been uh, uh, occupied, um, the enforcement officers go out and they say to the three men they see driving the diggers, um, uh, what are your names? And the defendants say, we shan't tell you. Then um, the, the first defendant might be persons un, a person unknown driving the digger shown in the photograph. The second uh, uh, defendant might be described as person unknown at standing beside the digger. And the third defendant, the third man, might be uh, described as being a, post, a person unknown shown in the photograph standing in the door uh, of the caravan on the site. And then you might have a fourth category of persons unknown, uh, persons intending to deposit hardcore or, or to move on to the site. So, and you would explain all that in the witness statement. Um, uh, in order to comply with the rule of court. Um, so here are some recent examples of injunctions uh, uh, granted um, uh, this year um, and how the persons unknown were described. And the first one is the very recent um, uh, injunction that was granted to stop people protesting uh, on the M25 persons unknown, causing the blocking, endangering, slowing down, obstructing, or otherwise preventing the free flow of traffic onto or along the M25 motorway 
for the purpose of protesting. No mention of trespassing on the motorway, uh, no, no mention of any a breach of the Highways Act. The description shows what the unlawful conduct is and describes it in non-technical language. A planning injunction was granted against persons unknown intending to live on or carry out activities covered by paragraph two of this order on the land off, and then said where the land was. And in paragraph two of the order, there was the uh, um, uh, a prohibition uh, against depositing hardcore, putting up fences, and so on and so forth. Again, no mention of a breach of planning control or anything like that. Uh, here's a, a perfectly straightforward one. Persons unknown depositing hardcore, bringing caravans and residentially occupying the land. And then um, the last one, um, again, um, a, a case this summer um, brought by a set of barristers chambers in London um, whose um, uh, IT hardware, uh, hardware was being attacked. Person or persons unknown responsible for engaging in a cyber attack on the applicants on or about the 12th of June and or who's threatened to disclose the information thereby obtained. And the court was satisfied that that was sufficiently uh, precise. And then uh, once you've persuaded the judge uh, that um, an injunction ought to be granted against persons unknown, and once you've persuaded the judge that you've uh, appropriately described the persons unknown, uh, the next thing that has to happen is that the, that you have to uh, um, persuade the judge uh, about service. And um, the court rules provide that the court may make an order permitting service by an alternative met method or at an alternative place, but the order under the uh, that the judge makes must specify the method or place of service, the date on which the claim form is deemed served, the period for uh, filing an acknowledgement of service, filing admission or filing a defence. And all of those things must be on the face of the order uh, uh, to make alternative service um, compliant with the rules. Now, um, uh, judges ought to know that but um, uh, local authorities uh, um, uh, ought to remind the judge, and when they draft a draft order, when they submit a draft order to the court, the um, local authorities' um, advocate uh, ought to make sure that all of those things are on the face of the order. Uh, and they're there for a reason, because the proposed method of alternative service must reasonably be expected to bring the proceedings to the attention of the defendant. And in this case, the defendant is the person unknown. And um, if you've got to persuade the judge uh, about alternative service, you'll need evidence. Uh, you'll need to explain to the judge how the proposed method can reasonably be expected to bring the proceedings to the attention of all, all of those who are sought to be made defendants. And that means, as Mr Justice Nicklin said, the greater and more ambi ambitious the width of the de definition of persons unknown in the claim form, the more difficult it is likely to be to satisfy the requirements for an order for alternative service. So if you've got a, an all, if you're just bringing a claim form against a person unknown who's driving the digger or, or living in the caravan, uh, then the, um, the order for service might be simpler. If you're trying to um, uh, um, include persons unknown intending to live, um, it's rather more complicated. But you'll need evidence as to how you propose to do that and how that will reasonably uh, bring uh, notice to those um, you have described as persons unknown. For example, it might mean that if you're going to rely on notices at a site entrance, somebody is going to have to check um, uh, fairly frequently that the notices remain in place. 
Uh, Tim uh, 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 touched on this um, uh, next slide uh, this morning, the ongoing duties. Um, if you become of aware of a material change in circumstances, then you're uh, under a duty to what's called restore the case within a reasonable period to the court for reconsideration. And then the second duty is this. In the period between the grant of any interim injunction and the subsequent trial for a final order, uh, the claimant must identify, either by name or other method, the persons against whom they seek a final judgment. Because a final order is not, um, uh, to use the Latin words contramundum, or the English against the world, And so um, after you've got the injunction against the, um, the person unknown in the red jumper driving the digger shown in the photograph, uh, uh, if you um, then uh, afterwards discover what their name is, then you ought to be, uh, I, I, well, not ought to be, then you must apply to the court to join them as a named defendant. So you would add them as a named defendant. Uh, if you're uh, uh, drafting a draft order against persons unknown, um, what you uh, uh, also can um, usefully include it, it is an order that anybody who files an acknowledgement of service or wants to take part in the proceedings themselves should apply to become a named defendant. Because what you want between the granting of the interim injunction and the uh, trial for a final order, what you want is to gradually identify um, uh, all of those relevant parties. Now you should always identify the landowner. Uh, even if you don't know their name uh, straight away, um, because there hasn't been time in a very urgent case to do a land registry search or whatever, um, it, you need uh, always to identify the landowner. Uh, and you would seek, if the landowner is not uh, um, part of the people who are, um, are actually uh, occupying the site or carrying out works on the site, you ought to seek an order against the landowner as causing or permitting people to live on the site or causing or permitting hardcore uh, to be uh, deposited. Uh, you need to, uh, uh, um, uh, to identify, uh, evidence needed to identify the landowner is uh, usually a land registry certificate, but if there's been a, 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 a planning application, for example, uh, that includes the certificate um, that the applicant is the landowner, um, th then you can um, uh, use that as well. Um, so that's persons unknown. Uh, a, a brief word about uh, borough-wide injunctions. Um, it, it's now very difficult to get them approved. Um, uh, after the uh, Bromley case, there's been a whole spate of cases where... Um, local authorities have had to um, uh, bring back to court borough-wide injunctions granted some time ago for the court's reconsideration. And the, uh, the courts have now decided that, that in order to get a borough-wide injunction in the future, planning authorities must regularly engage with the Gypsy and Traveller community or their representatives. They should consider negotiated stopping places they should assess the impact on the gypsies and travellers resorting to the borough and the area. Um, they should explain what positive action and positive action is going to be required by the planning authority to respect the gypsy and traveller way of life and culture. That will include, of course, uh, having an up-to-date uh, GTAA and uh, also um, an up-to-date local plan. 
Uh, there's a, 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 a legal doctrine called the doctrine of clean hands. That means if, if somebody comes to the court asking uh, for assistance, the court will take into account uh, um, whether or not they've complied with their uh, general obligations, in this case, to provide sufficient accommodation and transit sites for the gypsy and traveller community. So you'll need evidence uh, of need and the provision of sites. You'll need evidence of alternative sites. You'll need evidence, you'll need evidence of what's happening in neighbouring boroughs. Because if you get a, a borough-wide injunction in your borough, um, that has at least the possibility of simply exporting the problem to next-door boroughs. And the courts have said that these borough-wide injunctions are now to be regarded as being inherently problematic because they give the gypsy and traveller community no room for manoeuvre. So rather than borough-wide injunctions, there have been uh, some injunctions that have survived where they seek to protect particularly vulnerable sites. Uh, the courts have said they must be for a duration that provides for periodic review and credible evidence of past conduct, i.e. a past problem, is, um, is needed. So if you're, if you're thinking of, of uh, going for a borough-wide injunction, uh, you need to uh, have a look at that, uh, those cases and to take appropriate <coughs> advice. Well, thank you very much for listening. I'll stop sharing my screen now. And um, we will have a look at the Q&A box. Um, and I've first of all got a question about if an if a known person unknown had undertaken a historical breach but falls into the hit and run category, does the owner of the land get identified instead as the presumed person who asked for the deposit and or accepted it? Uh, well, a couple of things raised by that. If you've got a known person unknown, then there won't be a person unknown. You'll be able to name them. Um, uh, but if you don't uh, know them, uh, yes, you can get, um, uh, you would certainly include the landowner um, and you would, uh, uh, if there's no evidence that that landowner actually did the, um, the act of depositing, for example, uh, then you uh, might allege that they had caused or permitted the hardcore to be deposited or to remain on the land. Um, then secondly, do the borough-wide injunctions just apply to gypsy and traveller cases or would the current stance also be uh, applicable in cases of all persons? Um, good question. Um, I think probably they would be um, applicable to all persons. I think there was a, um, a, a case down in a London, North London borough um, who was trying to stop um, acts of mass trespass on... Um, a particularly attractive part of the borough. So I, I, I think that probably um, uh, could be a, a applied. Um, and then what's the third question? Ah, it relates to the first one. Sorry, I meant if you don't know who the person unknown is, but you know someone other than the landowner did it. So you don't know who the person unknown is. Um, uh, it, it would be a very difficult um, you couldn't injunct somebody to remove um, material deposited um, if they're not known. So all you could do would be to prevent further hardcore being deposited by persons unknown intending to deposit. Uh, and then you might seek um, an order um, requiring the landowner to remove it. Um, whether you get that as an interim order or only after a trial is a moot point. Tim, do you want to say anything about those um, questions? On Jonathan Hodge's question, um, I do think there may be certain special circumstances where there's a threat to an individual um, where uh, you must not come in our borough would apply. If a planning officer had been threatened with violence by someone um, or a council officer had been uh, the purpose of that would injunction would be um, not something which there wouldn't be a 
shifting of a problem to some other council. Uh, and I think the courts would have to look at that in a different way to the way they looked at gypsies and travellers, protesters, caravan dwellers, and so on. So if, if, a, if, if you were protecting a council officer from threats of violence, you might wish to have a, from someone who lived outside the borough, you might wish to have a, a borough-wide matter. But in general terms, the, the principles must apply not only to gypsies and travellers, but to uh, other groups of people uh, who might trespass on land. Yeah, somebody's uh, put in the, um, uh, the Q&A, Andy, it'll be interesting to see how the M25 injunctions play, plays out. They've arrested people and have their names, but what about persons unknown in the future? How's the injunction going to be worded after the final hearing? Yeah, well, two things. First of all, um, the... Uh, uh, the police have continued to um, arrest the protesters because, of course, once there's an injunction in place, um, the local, the uh, highways agency, Highways England, will have to um, uh, initiate committal proceedings, um, and um, it will take some time before these people are brought before the court and uh, tried for being in contempt. Um, in the meantime, if they're not um, dissuaded by the injunction, um, in order to um, stop the traffic being snarled up, the police are going to have to continue to arrest people for obstructing the highway. Um, uh, and it will, we will see um, whether or not these injunctions are an effective way of um, dealing with the problem. Um, but I agree with you, uh, it's going to be also be a very interesting um, uh, issue as to how the injunction is going to be worded after the final hearing. Um, what uh, should be happening is that every time they arrest somebody, um, they should be applying to... Um, add that person as a named defendant so that uh, over time there ought to be a growing list of named defendants against whom the final order can be made. Um, but it also be, um, it will be interesting to see how they um, uh, word the order. Um, there's going to be, uh, there's already issues as to whether, um, whether or not parts of the motorway that have been occupied on the, for example, the Heathrow Spur Road are part of the M25 or not, or whether they, that's part of a different road. Um, and then we also know that the, some of the protesters said, well, that's fine. We shall simply uh, drive around the M25, down the M2 to Dover and snarl up the traffic there. And so the Secretary of State then had to go and get another injunction to prevent people blocking um, the motorway or the roads going into the port of Dover. Now, I don't think this, any court would give a, a countrywide injunction um, preventing people protesting on any road in the country. So the Secretary of State may well be chasing his tail for a bit. I don't know. But it's not simple. It's not simple. Have you got any thoughts on that, Tim? No, not really. Um... It is a very different matter from gypsies and travellers, so care, care in applying the same principles. I just uh, emphasise um, what you said about the Heathrow Spur Road. Uh, any injunction uh, needs to be precise. Uh, and if a court is in doubt um, as to whether something is covered by the injunction, then the doubt has to be resolved in favour of the defendant. Yeah. Oh, um, top tip um, for local authorities watching... Um, which um, I, I learned when I was getting um, a without notice injunction by Zoom um, this summer from a high court judge. If you exhibit a plan to an, uh, uh, an injunction order and say it's the land edged red, um, the judge said to me, well, Mr. Richards, what happens when somebody takes a photo, a black and white photocopy of it? Uh, and so what he said was, it's much better in his experience to say, well, it's the land edged red and hatched black. 
so that um, w when you take a, a, a black and white photocopy, the land can still be identified because it's hatched black. So um, that's another point about identifying the land that's subject to the order. Um, think about a photo, f think about think about photocopying. <laughs> That really is a familiar problem uh, to advocates that we receive uh, piles of paper with something edged in red and we struggle to guess where the red line might be uh, because it's been photocopied in black and white. Yeah. Uh, and the court also has that problem. Well, the first thing I do when I'm uh, uh, representing gypsies and travellers is to check what the order is. And if the order says it's against the land edge red and there isn't any land edge red, because a black and white copy was attached to the order, then the order's meaningless. And that's the first thing I check when I'm acting for um, for gypsies and travellers. Well, it should be said, I normally act for gypsies and travellers, um, but uh, clearly I also act for local authority in non-gypsy and traveller matters. The, the, the duty of precision is important from everyone's point of view. Everyone should know where they stand. Um, and edged red when you get black black and white photocopies is hopeless from all points of view. Yeah. Okay, are there any other... I don't think there are any um, other unanswered questions in our Q&A box. Um, so unless anybody's got anything to type into the Q&A box, we'll probably bring this matter or this webinar to a close two minutes early. Can I just remind people, first of all, we're very grateful if you could fill in the feedback forms. It, it helps us uh, to, to try and improve matters. Uh, and secondly, that slide, the slides are available on request uh, from marketing at number5.com. Well, thank you all very much. I know that I'm going to see at least one of you in a Zoom conference in one hour's time. So. Um, but for the rest of you, um, I will see you anon. And thank you for watching. And thank you from me. Goodbye.